Welcome everyone to our week six presentation. You might hear a little background noise, baby's awake. <laughs> Trying to get this out to you as soon as possible and that's just how it goes. So um, welcome, this is my presentation on MLA citation and formatting. We are starting to move into essays that do require some research. So I think it's important to make sure that we understand how to cite the sources with MLA, a little bit about formatting and then um, Hopefully this will help you out this week. So let's go ahead and get started. So what is MLA? So MLA stands for Modern Language Association. It's a style of formatting and citation that um, is used in humanities, humanities disciplines. So things like uh, literature, English. Uh, you also have um, journalism and that kind of stuff. So this is just uh, the type of citation that is used in a lot of different college courses. Now you might find other types of citations used elsewhere. So like APA citation is used in more science regions of uh, discipline. So you might run into that as well. But we focus on MLA in this particular class and you will um, in other humanities courses. So um, MLA regulates the document format, so the actual format of your physical document. It also talks about in-text citations and works cited citations, and we're going to talk about both of those today. So there are two types of citations, that's parenthetical and works cited. Parenthetical, uh, we're going to talk about first, but that's basically in-text citations. That's going to be the information that you find in the text of the document, and then the works cited page. So when do you use citations? We talked about this earlier in the term concerning um, integrating source material into your work. But when do you use citations? So you use this any time that you find outside information and you use it in your paper outside of your own thoughts and ideas. So you have to use citation any time you use that material. So it can come in the form of paraphrasing you know where you put the text into your own words. Summaries where you kind of give an overall viewpoint of a particular source and then quotes which is when you actually take the exact words out of a source and use it in your paper that would include quotation marks as well. And um, what about common knowledge? So things like you know who was the first president of the United States and um, how many senators are part of the Senate, how many representatives are in the House of Representatives. So these are questions that should be <laughs> common knowledge, things that most people know. And if you find uh, that you are going to use common knowledge information in your papers, you do not have to cite it. So whether that's, you know, uh, part of the Bill of Rights or some basic historical information, um, either way that these are common knowledge elements, you don't have to cite those types of things. So let's talk about parenthetical citation. Um, this happens when you are actually showing the source material in the body of your paper. So when you quote or paraphrase or summarize directly after you do so, you should include parenthetical citation. So this is um, the, the in-text citation. So with MLA format, the basic structure of in-text citation uh, will include the author's last name and the page number that the work was found on. So um, I have an example, Smith 23, notice there's no punctuation in between the two, and there's parentheses around the material. Um, however, these there are circumstances where this type of format cannot be applied. Um, it depends on the type of source that you're using. Um, parenthet parenthetical citations will depend on the medium that you are using, so print or web or DVD or whichever way that you're citing sources. Um, a web source, for instance, most likely won't have a page number, so that might be, look a little different. And then parenthetical citations will also depend on the way that your source is presented and the text of your document. So let's look at what that actually entails. So I have a couple examples here. Both of them um, include quotations. So the first one says Wordsworth stated the, that romantic poetry was marked by a quote, spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings. Notice in the parentheses it says the page number, page 263. It does not have the author's name because in the text of the sentence we have the author's name, Wordsworth. It's stated at the very beginning so we don't have to double state it into the citation. Um, and then we could see this in a different way. Romantic poetry is characterized by the quote, spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings 
end quote, and then we have the citation with the author's name in it. Um, we can so notice the where it belongs in that quote. So we have the end quotation mark here. There's a space and then the parentheses. There's no extra punctuation marks other than the end quotation. And then the period of the sentence is at the end. And then we have a paraphrase. Wordsworth extensively explored the role of emotion in the creative process and then the citation again. So even if you have a quote and a and a paraphrase in the same paragraph, we need to have two separate citations. Every time you have a quote, directly after the quote, you have to put a citation, whether it's with the author's name or not. You have to have it directly after that quotation. Um, with paraphrasing, it's a little different. You can actually add that to, to the end of the paragraph. Uh, I prefer that it's closer, but um, in terms of MLA formatting, you can put the paraphrase citation at the end of the paragraph. But you do have to have both if you have two different things in your paragraph. And then we also have the works cited entry for this particular uh, source. And we'll talk about works cited in just a little bit. But this notice that it has all the other information about the source. It has the author's name, the title of the work, where it was published, wh um, who published it, and when it was published. And also the medium in which it was published. So the, where did you find it? Was it print? Was it web? so on and so forth. So um, we'll talk more about that in just a little bit in the presentation. So not all sources are alike. Obviously you probably already know that. You might use books at your library. You might use a physical newspaper. You might use an online source or even a source without an author. So MLA Citation Style has a format for each of these types, um, whether it's print, online, film, image, whatever it is. And um, all sources should be cited with both in, parent, in text or parenthetical citation and works cited page citation. So you should have two corresponding citations in your paper for each source, at least. And you might have more in text citations, um, but you only need one works cited citation for each of the sources that you use. A um, little bit about works cited citations they're found at the end of your document. They share all the information needed for the reader to. Uh, go out and research for their self. So find the source and do his or own research. It also helps to ensure that you as a student avoids plagiarism. So let's talk about these in-text citations and how they work. So I've already used this particular example before um, in terms of a print source with an author, but we'll go ahead and look at that again. Notice that um, if the author's name is stated in the sentence, then you have just the page number at the end. If you do not have the author's name in the sentence, then you include the author's name in the citation. And then of course we have the works cited entry for this particular source. It has the author's information, the title information, the place it was published, who published it, when it was published, and what type of format is it published in. This is the basic format for most sources with MLA, and we'll look at this, how it relates to web sources as well. So what if you don't know the author's name? This happens a lot when you are researching on the internet, but it can also help, it can also happen in print sources as well. But um, if you do not have the author's name, not to worry, that you can still use the source. Um, we have an example here with a quote. So we see so many global warming hotspots in North America, likely because this region has, quote, more readily accessible climate, climatic data and more comprehensive programs to monitor and study environmental change, end quote. Um, and then we have the in-text citation. And notice there is a title in quotation marks and then the page number. So let's look at this, what it would look like with the works cited. Um, this would happen, so if it was a web source, and we have the title of the web page here, Global Warming Early Science, and then the title of the article that you found on that web page. Uh, I want to go back here. Notice that this is not the entire title, Impact of Global Warming. The entire title is The Impact of Global Warming in North America. So you don't have to include the entire title when you have an unknown author, but you do need to include uh, a portion of it so we clearly understand which title you're referring to. So um, the basic structure is still similar. So we have instead of the author we can just leave that part off and then we have the title of the article, the title of the website, 
the year that it was published, the way that it was published, web, and then when did we access. So this last date is the date of accessing the source. So this is most likely going to be recent rather than in 2009, but the date you actually found the source online. Um, the new form of MLA format does not require that you include the actual URL. You can just write web that you found it on a web page. So let's look at some other in-text citations. Uh, if you have classic and literary works with multiple editions that you are citing, uh, you would include the page number and the chapter that it was found in. So that's a little different. So we have Marx and Engels described human history as marked by class struggles. This is page 79, chapter 1. So this uh, allows us to understand the that it's a, a part of a greater work, that it has multiple editions, and that you are citing multiple editions. So Marx and Engels might have multiple editions of the same work that you are citing in your paper. This doesn't happen very often, but if you need to cite the chapter, it's right there. Um, what about if you have authors with the same last name? Not a problem. We just include the first initial of each in the citation, like R. Miller and A. Miller, to differentiate between the two. Um, works by multiple authors. So that means sometimes you have works, even our textbook, that has more than one author. And that's not a problem. You can include all the author's names in the in-text citation. So in different examples, so we have Smith, Yang, and Moore argue. So you have them cited in the text of your sentence with the page number. Or you have at the uh, in-text in citation, Smith, Yang, and Moore. Notice and is spelled out. There's commas in between each name, just like you would in any type of list. Um, and there's no no punctuation between the author's name and the page number. Now what if you have more uh, authors? The, sometimes you have five or more authors and to express that you can use the phrase et al. So that just means everybody else. Um, so Jones and his colleagues, so the several other authors, uh, can be expressed through et al. And uh, you do that if you have five or more sources, uh, authors for a source. Um, if you have multiple works by the same author, you treat it like you were going to um, write a citation for a source that does not have an author. Um, so uh, in the reference or page or the work cited page, you will actually cite each individual source by that author separately, but for the in-text citation you're going to regulate that by the title of the work by that author rather than the author's name. Another way to do that might be to add the author's name in there with a comma and then the author then the title of the work. That's also available. Notice in this text it has the author's name here and then the different works. So in this does not have the author's name, so you have the author's name, comma, and then the works title. So there are lots of different ways. I've included um, ways to cite the Bible, ways to cite multi-volumes. Um, and for instance, this has volume one and then the page numbers. Um, the Bible has the actual Bible version title in uh, italics and then the reference, so the book, chapter, and verses, um, it's, which is a little different. So if you do cite the Bible, this would be the format. So um, King James Bible, New Jerusalem Bible, American Standard Version Bible, whatever version of the Bible you're using, and then the actual traditional reference of the uh, book, chapter, and verse. Now what if you are quoting another author from a source that that author didn't write? So you're, it's called indirect sources. So for instance, um, if you have, a, like in our textbook, or an encyclopedia type of source, or other things that actually quote outside sources, and you want to use that quote from the outside source, you can do so. So here's an example I could do Revit 
argues that high school schools are pressured to act as social service centers and they do, don't do that well. So Revec is quoted by Weissman and we have here it says quoted in Weissman and then the page number and then the works cited page is actually going to cite Weissman. So we're letting know that this guy was quoted in this work and um, you could also type that up with Revec here, Revec quoted in Weissman if you didn't use his name in the actual text of your, of your uh, sentence. And sometimes when you summarize multiple sources and kind of put them together, or you find the same information in two different sources and you want to make sure that it's clear that that information is found in both sources, you can cite multiple uh, works in the same citation and that would just be ex communicated by doing both citations with a semicolon in between. Other things, so miscellaneous non-print sources. Um, you might happen to have, uh, let's see, so here is one from a film. Werner Herzog's Fitzcarraldo stars Herzog's longtime film partner Klaus Kinski during the shooting of Fitzcarraldo, Herzog and Kinski were often at odds, but their explosive relationship fostered a memorable and influential film. Now notice that the author's name is said many times in the text of that sentence, uh, or sentences. And actually, there's no page number because it's a film. So you wouldn't actually have to have an in-text citation here because it's com communicated in the text of the sentence. The um, director, which is what you would do for a film. Now we would still have a work cited page entry, which would have the director's last name. Make sure that it's clear that it's the director, um, the title of the work, the uh, performer, which is actually, I would be like the star of the show. Um, you could also end up having uh, producers and that kind of stuff here. Uh, who is the um, producing agent or the uh, film company, the year that it was produced, and then the medium, which is film. Here's another example of, uh, this is an internet source. So one online film critic stated that Fitzcarraldo is, quote, a beautiful and terrifying critique of obsession and colonialism. So this is Gar Garcia and Garcia is critiquing, this is the article title, Herzog, A Life. And then we have the actual work cited, citation, Garcia, Elizabeth, the, the title of her critique, where it, was, where it was published, so the website that it was on, Online Film Critics Corner, um, who publishes it, the Film School of New Hampshire, comma, the date that it was published online and then web because it's an internet source and then the date that you accessed the information. So um, that's kind of a basic overview of several different ways you can do in-text citation and I'm going to add some sources at the end of this presentation that you can go to um, to find more information about different types of sources. One of the most important things when you are creating citations is to understand what kind of source do you have and then being able to line that up with the formatting for that kind of source. Um, I don't think that you need to feel like you should that you should have to memorize these things. Um, I don't have them memorized. Uh, most people do not have all the different types of citation elements memorized. If they do, it's amazing, great for them. <laughs> but I don't, that's why we have MLA formatting manuals. We actually have one in the back of our textbook, uh, which you can utilize to find source material. And there's other sources out there to find ways to cite your sources. So don't feel like you have to memorize all this stuff. It's really to give you a clear understanding of the format and what to do. So um, on the board what I have are some formatting for short quotations. Sometimes you might use a, like a couple words from a source and you want to cite it. And of course you should even if it's short. 
that's not a problem. Um, but to do so, it still needs to have a citation directly after the quote. So I have some examples here of how you would format that in an actual sentence. So I have, according to some, comma, dreams express, quote, profound aspects of personality, though others disagree. So this is a, a complete sentence that has a quote in the middle. And we just add the in-text citation right after the quote. Um, notice that it's also inside the punctuation mark. So you would do the same thing with that comma that you would do with a period at the end of the sentence, um, which is like here. According to folk study, dreams may express profound aspects of personality. No, no punctuation outside the quotation mark and then the end punctuation after the citation. The same kind of thing goes with where you put the punctuation with things like question marks. Or if you have multiple page numbers, colon concludes, comma, of all things that happen there, that's all I remember. End quotation mark, citation with two pages, um, and then the period at the end. So if you have a long quote, this is where it gets a little bit different with the formatting. All your other in-text citations were found within the end punctuation of your sentence. Now if you have a long quotation, that means it takes up more than three lines of text on your page. Um, if you have those long quotations, you need to set them apart a little differently. So I have an example here. This would be part of the main body of a paragraph that I'm writing for my paper. So Nellie Dean treats Heathcliff poorly and dehumanizes him throughout her narration. Sorry about the baby. She's having a grand time. Um, and then I have a colon that introduces the long quote and then the long quote. Notice that it is set apart. It is indented one inch from the left hand side of the page. All the line is straight down on that indent. We share the very long quote. It has an end punctuation at the end and then we have the citation. There's no end punctuation at the end of this type of citation when you have a really long quote. So that's um, another way to format to keep in mind. You can add words or, or take a word, away words from quotes as well. Uh, times you would do that is if the quote uses information, like, uses like vague phrasing that is referring to another part of a paragraph or something, um, or if it's referring to uh, personal pronouns or like he, she, and we want to know who the he, she are, so we can insert that with brackets. Notice the squareness of these brackets. So um, Jan Harold Brunvind, an, in an essay on urban legend states, quote, some individuals who retell urban legends make a point of learning every rumor or tale. Now we don't want to just add words to add words. They actually need to make sense for the sentence. Perhaps this information here was in a, a previous part of the source. So we're not adding anything that's not relatable to the source material. Um, we're just trying to clarify without adding too much of a quote from the work. Uh, and sometimes you might want to take out extra information. Maybe the quote has uh, an extra long list or some modifying phrases that are not necessary to your point, and you can take them out and replace it with an ellipsis. That's what this dot 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 is. Everybody's seen it, everyone's used it, but this is the appropriate use in academic writing to replace words that you don't want to share in a quote. So an ellipsis, the dot, dot, dot. Notice there's a space in between each of these. That's the appropriate way to format this. Yes, you can use ellipses to create emphasis or pause, but those are generally not used in academic writing. It's more for personal writing or for creative writing. Okay, so now we go on to the works cited page. We mentioned this earlier. But the works cited page is at the end of your document. It's where you share the extended amount of information for all the sources that you used in the body of your essay. So uh, basic structure is going to have a hanging indent, and we'll take a look at what that looks like. Uh, it's going to have alphabetized sources. So on the left-hand side margin, all the sources will be alphabetized. And um, it still needs to be double spaced, just like the rest of your document. Then I have uh, the basic structure of a citation there at the bottom. Oh, 
which is the author's name, the title information, and the publication information. All your citations will have this basic format, but it will have different means of going about it depending on the type of source you have. But you will start with the author's information, share the title information, and then the publication information. It goes in that order. Uh, this is what a works cited page might look like in your document. Um, there's lots of different things to pay attention to here. So we have the actual title, works cited, at the very top of the page. There's no extra spacing between the title of the page and this first source. Um, notice that it is alphabetized. Adorno, Bernard, Burke, Demand, Tell. So notice that the, the author's names or whatever information is on the left hand side is alphabetized. We also have a hanging indent. That means where the first line of the page is, or of the citation, is directly flush with the left hand side of the page. And then every other line is indented half an inch. So that's different um, than your normal. Sorry about that. Uh, format for a paragraph or something. And then I did want to show this is uh, multiple works by the same author, Burke. And we just have this little dash here to show that we're still doing Burke and then his different um, sources, his different articles that he wrote for the same author. So that's where, how you would do that. So um, for books, uh, print books, you would follow this particular format. So your last name, comma, first name of the author, period. The title of the work, which needs to be italicized. We don't underline titles anymore. We italicize them. The place of the publication, whether that be New York, London, you know, St. Louis, who knows, um, with a colon after it. And then the publisher, so that's what is the company that published the work, comma, and the year the work was published. So that's the most recent year of publication. So you might have a document that was, a, was first published in 1876, but the edition that you have was published in 1961. So you need to use the 1961 number. So there's some examples here at the bottom of the page. Um, here's another one where we have the same author, Palmer, used. So we have that dash there. Um, but you can see it's last name, first name, with a comma in between, period at the end. Then italicize the title of the book, the place that it was published, the company that published it, the year that it was published, and the medium. So it's a print book. So it's an actual physical book that you went somewhere and got. So for a periodical, which is a magazine or journal, um, you also have a similar format um, with a little bit different. So we have the author's information, so that's with the last name, first name format, the title of the article in quotation marks, where, what magazine it was published in, so that's the actual title of the periodical and then the day, month, and year of the publication because a lot of times magazines are published oh my goodness um, one second I'm gonna pause and I'll get right back alright I'm back sorry about that so I have um, the periodicals here so we have different formats and this is an example of how that would go so the author's last name first name the title of the article the title of the publication. Notice there's no punctuation after that. The month and year that it was published. Sometimes you might have a day for the periodical, but if you don't, you would just have the month and the year. And then the page numbers and that it was a print magazine. So this might be a web magazine or so on and so forth. If it was web, all you would do is say web and then you would add the date that you found the article. Um, here is a journal. So journals are very similar types of publications, but um, <clears throat> they have a similar format. So we have author's names, the title of the article, the title of the journal. This has a volume and issue number. So that might be a way that you can tell the difference between a periodical and a journal is if it has a volume and an issue number. And then the year that it's published in parentheses with a colon and then the page number. So that's a little bit different. So volume, period, issue, 
year that it was published in parentheses, the uh, colon, and then the pages, and then the medium, how, how you found it. So here's an example. We have Duval, comma, John, in, uh, quote, for the title of the article, the supermarket of images, television as an unmediated mediation in DeLillo's white noise, period, in quotation mark, the title of the journal, Arizona Quarterly, volume 50, issue 3, 1994, page numbers, and print. Notice you don't have to put page 127 to 153. You can just do 127 to 53. That gives us a clear understanding that it's actually 153. <laughs> um, so the works cited web source is also similar. It still has the author information, title information, publication information, but it's going to include some different elements. So if it's a web source, you're going to use the editor, author, or compiler name. So whichever one is available. Um, it really depends with websites. You might have an author's name. You might have more of a compiler, compiler's name, um, an editor's name. You don't really know what you're going to come across with a, a web source, but we're going to use one of those if we can find them. Um, and then the article name, which would be in quotation marks. So you would have that. It's basically the web page that you are on ha usually will have a title at the top, and then it's part of a greater a website, right? So we have the article name or the web page name, the name of the site, so website name. If there's a version, you would have a version number here. If there's an institutional organization affiliated with the site, so that could be a university, it could be who is sponsoring that site uh, in terms of you know who's paying for it kind of thing. And then you would put in parentheses what kind of thing that is. So is it a sponsor, is it a publisher? You'd put that in parentheses after the name of the institution. The date of the last update. So that can be usually found at the bottom of the web page. And then the medium of publication, you put web, and the date you accessed that information. The reason why we do that is sometimes those web pages can change per date. And so if I were to go on the website that you went to and find that the information is not correct, um, I could say, oh, well, maybe it's because I accessed it later than you did. So um, keep that in mind as well. So let's look at some examples. So we have one Bernstein comma mark with the 10 tips of writing on the live, uh, on the, on writing the living web. Okay. <laughs> a list apart for people who make websites. So that's the title of the website. Um, it's sponsored by the organization, a list apart magazine. And then, uh, the date it was pu published or last updated was August 16, 2002. It's a web source, and then I found it May 2009, May 4, 2009. Um, here's a similar one. This is from Purdue University. So we have here's the Purdue University with a comma, and then the date that it was updated. That's a web source, and the date that I found it. Um, notice there's no article title. That's fine if you're if you're citing the entire website, then you don't need an article title. Um, here's one that doesn't have an author. So this is an ehow.com um, format, and we don't have an article, but we do have an article title, or we don't have an author, but we do have an article title, How to Make Vegetarian Chili. Um, and the title of the web page is actually ehow.com. Um, the title of the sponsoring organization is ehow. It's a company. Um, there is no date that we found that it was... Uh, last updated, so you put ND for no date. It is a web source and then accessed it on this day. You can also cite sources like personal interviews, um, and it's pretty pretty simple. You would put the, the person that you interview uh, first with last name first, then, then first name, write that it's a personal interview, and then the date that you did the interview. I do want you to notice the way that dates are set up with MLA formatting. We have the day that it was published, the month, and then the year. That's consistent with all MLA citations. So when you present a date in your citations, that's the, going to be the format. Um, a speech can also be um, cited. And generally, those are going to be speeches that are at conferences or something like that. So you would have the speaker's name, the title of the conference, perhaps his speech had a title and you might want to put that in quotation marks but the conference that it, he is presenting at would be in 
in italics where it was where it was um, what is the sponsoring organization of that particular conference which would be this university and then where it was located where was the conference located so this actually has Union Club Hotel West Lafayette Indiana then the date of the presentation and here it says it's a keynote address films I've already mentioned film uh, in the in-text citations film can also be cited you have the title of the film the usual suspects the director um, Brian Singer uh, performers so that would be your headliner kind of people Sp Kevin Spacey Gabriel Byrne so on and so forth with the different um, performers and then the company that is putting the film out polygram comma the date that it was uh, produced and then that it was a film the medium so I've gone over several different types of citation there are plenty more out there I'm sure you'll go through this and go hey wait my source is this my source is that not a big deal there are lots of different sources available obviously we have our book with an MLA guide at the back but there's also um, the Purdue Online Writing Lab is really great so there's a link here to go to that and then there's also a website called citationmachine.net which is really cool uh, I wanted to actually go there oh let me add it so I wanted to go to this website because it is a pretty cool source like I said earlier, the most important part of citation is understanding what kind of source you have, and um, that can help you create citation. So this is a website that I've used as a college student and then as a teacher. Sorry, loud. Um, so I have what you would do is you choose your style of citation. So we have MLA. There's a couple things that you can do if you wanted to search for your source, um, determine if it's a book, a magazine, a newspaper, a website, a journal, a film, or other, and you would type in, type in information here and it can actually search for that particular uh, type of citation. Another way to do this is to use the old site, which I kind of like better, my own personal rep preference, but I'd go to MLA and then it has all different types of sources here. So I have print sources, which is book, encyclopedia, journals, magazines, newspapers, anthologies. It has just a list of all these different types of sources that you might go into. It also has non-print sources, so online journal, online magazine, a web document, a podcast, a blog, email communication. So it's all kinds of different types of sources here. And let's say I have an online journal article. I click on that particular link and then it takes me to this page which you basically go through and fill in the blanks. If you don't know what they're asking for you can click on help and it will tell you um, but you put the author's last name, first name, so you're just going to fill in the blank of what you have available to you. So let's, let's just say I am filling in the blank and um, giving me trouble. And then we might have a print document or a web document. If I and I'm going to say web, I don't have the URL there, so I'm just going to click on make citation. This is what's cool about citationmachine.net is that it makes it for you which is great. So you actually can just copy and paste this and stick it into your Works Cited page. It also tells you how to format the in-text citation as well. Pretty darn cool. So this is one source that you can use. I will say that it's not always 100% correct, so just double check the format and things. Sometimes it'll put multiple 
uh, punctuation marks and that kind of stuff. So just double check, make sure everything is set up correctly, but this is a great source for students to utilize the citation machine.net and I went to the old version so if I went to just the the page would look like this and then you can go up here to the old site or you can search for sources using this uh, format down here just a cool way to find out how to cite sources so here's my work cited for this presentation. Got a lot of this great information from the OWL Purdue website. So um, remember, let, let me uh, just go back to our home page and I'm going to course information. I'm just going to scroll down to week six so we know what we're doing this week. So remember you need to read page 314 from a sequence for academic writing and then also I have Taming of the Bicycle by Mark Twain. You can find that in course documents um, and then respond to week six discussion board. Obviously we have that. Please do respond earlier in the week. Our discussions are tending to happen um, toward the last day and I'd like to see more Sorry about that throughout the week. Um, and then we have our explanatory syn synthesis essay due by this Sunday at 11.59 p.m. I did want to take you to course documents real quick to take a look where to find the Mark Twain article because I've reformatted and organized this area of the course. So we have course documents and then our different types of elements here. So I'm actually going to go to teacher tips and links because this is a link and there is Mark Twain biography that I mentioned and then, and then we scroll down we can find Taming of the Bicycle right there. So I went to course documents, I went to teacher tips and links and then found the PDF file for Taming of the Bicycle. So that's all I got for you this week. Um, I look forward to seeing your participation in the discussion board and if you have any questions feel free to send them my way. But otherwise, have a wonderful week. We'll see you in the discussion board. Bye.